Welcome to the Diplo Woman Podcast, where we will be talking with and about incredible women mediators, facilitators, negotiators, ambassadors, peacemakers, peace builders, and more. I am Karma Eknekchi, and I will be your host in this journey of mainstreaming the women, peace, and security agenda into our lifestyles. With a focus on the Arab region, the Diplo Woman podcast comes to you in collaboration with the Isan Fars Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University of Beirut and is made possible by the generous support of UN Women. The Arabic subtitled video edition is available on the Diplo Woman podcast YouTube channel. We're thinking out loud with Haja Sharif in this fifth episode of the Diplo Woman podcast. Haja was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. She created this foundation called Together We Build It in Libya after the 2011 revolution. She's an active young woman peace builder that has advised the Security Council on Youth, Peace, and Security. We're honored to have you with us at the Diploma Podcast. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for having me. I'm very much looking forward for this conversation. As I told you in my email, I always enjoy an intellectual gossip. So I'm, I'm anticipating a frank, honest conversation that, that will take us all somewhere. Thank you, we're excited for that as well. Hajar, you were 19 when the revolution started in Libya and then the country slowly started spiraling into conflict, into instability. You were a medical student. Tell us what happened in Libya? What is happening in Libya through Hajar Sharif's eyes? Absolutely. I was 19 years old, 10 years ago, which is a little bit mind blowing to think that uh, it's already been 10 years. Um, actually, this July, I'm going to, uh, to be 29. Um, maybe a little bit of a background on how I ended up studying medicine, actually. And it's perhaps it's not really a story of inspiration, I must admit. Um, when I was in high school, the most famous TV show at the time was Grey's Anatomy. So I thought it looks like a really cool job and, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to become a surgeon. Um, so I, I, uh, I enrolled myself into a medicine school um, and I started the preparatory year. And then when I started the first year, um, the revolution uh, took place. That was in 2011. And throughout Throughout the full year of 2011, I must say this, this is perhaps a year that I will, I will never forget because whenever someone asks me, um, even on a very friendly basis, right? Like you get to know someone new, they ask you, what did you study? Where did you live? What did you do? And every time someone asks me this very simple question, I sort of stumble upon answering about my life before 2011 or after 2011 because they are actually fundamentally different. Um, so during 2011, um, as, as I said, it was, it, it was a tough year, but it, there, was, there was many moments um, where I learned lessons that I, I definitely won't forget in my lifetime. And one of them actually, me and my friends at the medicine school at the time where we were very, uh, um, pro-revolution, uh, we, we did everything we can at that time to support the revolution. Um, and, you know, um, um, young students wanting to change and seeing a possibility for a positive change. But the thing that was not really on my radar was the fact that although it was a revolution, and it, this is something that, that I highly respect, um, alongside, it was also an, an armed revolution. Um, so while we saw, you know, there was the protests, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there was the peaceful uh, means to, uh, to object the regime and, and try to bring along change, there was also an armed conflict taking place. No one really took into account the fact that there was extreme level of violence that was introduced to the society, right? Um, so for an example, 
Um, I've, I've never witnessed earth strikes before 2011. Um, I've never seen uh, people dead in the street, uh, um, um, even at the hospital, you know, uh, you, I've, I've never seen uh, those who are injured from the war. Um, and then in August 2011, um, when the fightings reached Tripoli, um, there was shortage in medical staff and not everyone was able to reach the hospitals. Um, so a few hospitals put out announcements to medical students to come and volunteer. Mm -hmm. uh, um, meanwhile, you know, the, the medical staff uh, would be able to reach the hospitals. And my first day at the hospital was, was, was more or less a reality check. I, I literally felt the minute I went into the hospital, I literally felt I, I walked through, through a time machine because for the past months from February until August, um, I was seeing and witnessing the revolution from, uh, from a completely different perspective, uh, more or less um, um, not really focusing much on the fact that there was a war going on, mm -hmm. not focusing much on the fact that there was civilians who were injured, displaced people. Um, and then the minute I walked into the hospital, the, the full image was completed. Um, and I remember I was just thinking, I was just thinking, is it all worth it? Was it really all worth it? Um, but at that point of time, um, I really didn't answer the question. And it's, it's interesting until this moment. Um, it's a very difficult question to answer because perhaps it's not yes or no. Um, but, you know, you can't help yourself to, to question something that, that where, where civilians were injured, as I said, and, and people who had nothing to do with the front lines um, fell victim to that I want to I want to pause a bit and 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 pick up on two things you said. Um, the first being that in 2011, a group of you, you know, young uh, uh, students, activists who believed in change, wanted to bring change to your country, uh, excited uh, to to be part of the revolution. And then you also said that the revolution started to become armed. So it, 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 it evolved from, from how it started. And I feel like we see this trend happening in, 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 in most of the, the revolutions that are happening, at least in the region. You once said that we do a lot of things in our peace community, you know, in the peace building community, but are we really getting a lot done? Uh, you don't think so because we're change phobic, you said. You use that term and, I, and, it, and it really struck me um, uh, because this is, a, this is a term that, you know, when you said it or I heard you saying it, uh, I reflected on it. And yes, somehow we, we are change phobic. Why is this the case? And why do we keep repeating practices and processes that seem to not work? You know, as, as a 19 years old at the time and as a, as a Libyan who grew up in Libya, um, you, you sort of see the world differently because you are living in this bubble um, where, where pretty much there was, this, this is something that is very known to everyone. There was no room for civil activism, so mm. to say. So actually under the Gaddafi regime, the only form of activism or collective work that you can conduct, it must be a charity work. And, and even then, uh, there is many regulations, there's many things that you need to take into account for it, for you to not cross the, the very fine line between charity and something else, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but I always had the view that the outside world was completely different, you know? Um, there, for me, there was Libya and there was the rest of the world. And I always thought the rest of the world managed to figure it out right. So when they would tell us, you know, maybe this is how you should do something or from our billions of years of experience and peace building and development and, and, and all of these, uh, these fields, you will assume that, well, they're speaking of experience, but not only that, um, they're also ex speaking from reflection. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the thing that I understood quite quickly after I co-founded the organization and started working with different uh, international actors is that, yes, there is a lot of experience, but 
there's not really much reflections on whether this, this particular way of doing things work or not. And that's why it's very easy to be repeated in other places. So just to give you an example, right? Um, I still remember the day when, you know, we have the United Nations mm -hmm. and we have within the United Nations, we have a very powerful body that's called the UN Security Council where the major nuclear powers sit. Um, so this is perhaps, one can say it's the most powerful military group in the whole world, bringing the, all the nuclear or, or most uh, of the powerful nuclear um, um, powers together. Um, so you will assume that once they take a decision um, that they know what they're doing, right? And, and I still remember, as I said, um, the day when the Security Council, this powerful group of, of countries, sat and decided that, well, they need to take an action to protect the civilians in Libya um, through airstrikes, uh, through um, um, enforcing a no-fly zone so airplanes cannot fly over Libya, etc. And they've done all of this to try to stop the Gaddafi regime from, um, from killing civilians, right? Um, and I still, as I said, I still remember when they took that decision and and you know, at the time I was very young thinking, okay, this group of people, they really know what they're doing. So we're, we're gonna take the word, we're listen all good. <laughs> and, and believe it, yes. Um, and then I also remember the many footages that we saw on, on different media outlets where, you know, they show you this clip um, from let's say the, the plane that conducted the airstrike and they show you that they've hit this very specific particular um, site that is, for example, used for a military base or something, and that there was no civilians dead. And I remember at the time I was hearing the word casualties. Uh, uh, and I was like, it, you, you know, it's, it, it, it doesn't resonate, right? The collateral damage. It doesn't, for me, at least at the time, it didn't mean anything. Collateral damage mm -hmm. can be so many different things. But that was one of the things that really striked me when when the day I walked into the hospital, that the first actually injured people that I saw in, in a full section was those who were injured by airstrikes. Um, so they were not those who were fighting at the front lines. They were the collateral damage. They, that was the collateral you damage. Put a face, you put a face to that term. Yeah, you put a face to that term, exactly. And that is one of the things where you, you just, if you take a moment to reflect on that, you just think, you know, there's no need right now to go into the details of, of you know, if, if there is a war, people are going to die, accept that. But let's just name it the way it is. Instead of saying collateral damage, let's tell everyone civilians got killed. Because unless we start doing that, then we're not gonna reflect ourselves, but we're also not giving the full war image to the rest of the world and the rest of the people, right? So calling something collateral damage is, is really quite misleading because I was misled at the time thinking that, you know, it's, a very, it's an airstrike that's gonna hit a very specific military base, for instance. And then many months later, you realize that actually the word collateral damage meant people were killed or injured. Um, and this is something that I got to know because I've seen it in person, but I also know that many other people don't know about this because not everyone will get the experience of walking into a hospital during a war and seeing what collateral damage is really all about, right? Thank, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing this experience. Um, Together we built it. You co-founded this organization um, because of the situation in Libya. Uh, you felt the need of doing something. Um, you know, a lot of young men and women, my students always ask me, you know, we're young, we're, we're powerless, we're helpless, we are helpless. What can we really do to bring change? What can we really do to impact, to influence, to, to drive change in our societies? Um, you're a great example of that. Uh, please tell us more about this organization, what it does, uh, what inspired you 
to create it, to continue with it, um, and to take it where it is today. Absolutely. So the Together We Build It organization and, and the whole process, the thought process of, of co-founding an organization, I would say it comes from two personal experiences. Mm -hmm. One that I had when, when I was very young, uh, which was called the Family Democracy Meeting System. And this is something that we can talk uh, more about later. Um, and the other experience is being part of a charity organization um, under the Gaddafi regime at the time. Um, so we're gonna come back, we're gonna come back to your Friday democracy meetings. You wanna we wanna hear about them some more, but after this uh, uh, this recount of Together We Build It. Absolutely. So when I was in, in medicine school, and, and I must say, actually, after, um, after medicine school, I, I didn't complete my, my degree as a, I didn't end up becoming a, a doctor, uh, because I watched Suits, and I was convinced that I should be a lawyer instead. <laughs> so I switched my major to, to law. Um, but when, when I first uh, entered the medical school, um, a, a group of friends who were students at the time as well said, you know, we're, we're going to start a charity organization. Um, we are in the founding phase and, and you're free to join. Um, and some of these students were actually senior students, so they were not in, in the same year as, as myself. And I remember at the time, I, I still remember the first meeting we had as a group. Mm -hmm. um, it was at university, it was at Tripoli University. And I remember one of the senior students said, you know, if you're coming to the meeting, bring your books, because when we're going to sit to have the meeting, we have to have the books on the table. So if anyone walks in, it will look like a studying session and not a meeting. And at the time, I think I, I was not really aware with the, the different regulations, um, but, but one can certainly say, you know, freedom of assembly was, was not something guaranteed at the time. Um, but, but I still remember us sitting in a circle um, and we all had our medical books in front of us um, and we were discussing the charity organization, um, but we all had a note in the back of our, our minds that, you know, if anyone external or stranger walks in or, or even without asking, you know, what you're doing or something, we have to immediately switch the conversation into a study and conversation, right? Um, we said, you know what, what happened has happened. There was a revolution, there was a war. Now it's time to rebuild. And it's just time for everyone to come together and rebuild Libya. Mm -hmm. um, and this is how we even thought of, okay, then it's, it's together we build it. We're going, we're gonna be a platform. We're gonna be a group of people who's going to facilitate bringing all different groups together to work towards one goal, which is rebuilding the country. And when we first started, um, as I said, we thought there was one war and the war ended. So our even our, uh, our mission and our vision, the way we articulated it, we said, we're going to be a group of people who's going to support the peaceful rebuilding of mm -hmm. the country. Um, and then after multiple wars and armed conflict took place, you know, throughout the past 10 years, um, our vision and our statement changed to, we are a group of people who are going to still bring all different groups together to first build peace. And then along that also think of the other um, um, issues that, that needs to be addressed in Libya. So, so the values of inclusivity, of diversity, of you know working together in intergenerational um, setting is what the organization also stands for. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Um, I want to go back to your uh, Friday democracy meetings for a reason. You grew up in Tripoli, Tripoli, Libya. Yeah. Uh, at a time where uh, you know the country was not a democracy, yet in your own household you created a democracy. Yes. Tell us how this worked, uh, because I feel like our listeners, uh, I mean, no matter what age, whether they're parents, whether they're, you know, uh, uh, young uh, students, 
I think they will be inspired by the story as I was, because I'm actually thinking of implementing this in my own home. So can you share with us what this uh, uh, mechanism looked like? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, before taking the decision, maybe you should check in with my mom just to make sure that from a parental perspective, it, it was a good idea because from, from a kid perspective, even now that I'm 28, I think it was a wonderful idea. Um, but the reason you should check in with her because um, her and my dad at the time as, as parents, they, they did give away their power, um, even if it was temporarily, but but it was, you know, it was like the prime minister or a president inviting someone and telling them for a day, you can, you can have my job. Um, but, you know, when, whenever I'm, I'm chatting with anyone or getting to know someone and, and we chat about our childhood, for instance, and I say, you know, I, I was brought up in a very diplomat, uh, um, democratic family. And in many cases, the response is, is like yeah 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 so so did we yeah huh? and I'm like no 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 you don't understand <laughs> you don't understand you don't know what I'm talking about when I mean a democratic family I mean a, like an official systematic way of of having democracy at, at our house and you know when when I explain it people are like it's it's, it's really explain like, it explain it tell us how did it work how it worked um one day, um, me and my brother uh, were playing outside in, in the street with the rest of my, my cousins. And my dad called us in, literally out of the blue. And he said, from now on, we're going to start having weekly meetings. Um, on Friday at around 7 p.m., we're going to come together as a family. And there is these rules. Um, there was two main rules. The first one was that everything that is discussed in the meeting needs to be confidential. Chatham House rules. Chatham House rules, yes. So if we discuss something in the meeting, I cannot go and tell my cousins, you know, this and this and this happened. So this was the first rule. The second rule was that, and, and I remember him saying this, he was like, you can criticize me and your mom, you need to be very respectful with that, but you can criticize us and we're not gonna take it, take it with us outside the meeting. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is something that was very important for us as kids because you think, I mean, although you are a kid then, you know, sometimes you say, um, you speak your mind to your parents, but you also sort of calculate how it's going, if they're going to retaliate or not, right? <laughs> It's like speaking at the Security Council. Every word needs to be weighed and you don't know what the repercussions are of what you're saying. Exactly, exactly like that. So when he said that, I think that was the moment where it really clicked in my mind. I was like, okay, this is going to be really cool, you know. Um, so for, for a few years, we continued doing that every Friday at 7 p.m., um, there were times, you know, during the summer holidays, for instance, me and my brother would be playing outside uh, with, the, with our cousins. And then when it's around seven, me and him know that we have to go back to the house and, and have the meeting. And we all, you know, came in with our notebooks. Um, there was, of course, the facilitator. My dad was the one who would lead the conversation. Uh, my mom would take notes. Um, and after every meeting you know we we literally until now we have a pile of book notes that dates back to more than 20 years ago with with all the notes um and and as kids everyone participating in the meeting had to sign um and i remember my other brother he was really young at the time he, he wasn't even able to participate verbally you know he couldn't speak um, but he was signing and next to his name, there was the, the title observer. <laughs> he was not a participant, <laughs> but he was an observer who literally was like, you know, scratching a little bit on the notebook as, as he, um, to show that he was there. But these meetings were really fundamental, I would say in, in my upbringing because of few things. First of all, I, I really understood what it means to make decisions, you know, mm -hmm. because 
for, for an example, if I'm if I'm watching a parliamentarian session on on the TV from whatever country it is, um, I can clearly see that you know that was us in the family democracy meeting. You face an issue or you bring an issue into the table. Um, people are going to discuss it. Um, so we did that as a family. Um, to give you a very concrete example, um, I used to love to sleep early, really super early, sometimes at 6 p.m., um, which is really early for Libya. <laughs> I don't know around the rest of the world, but it's very difficult to find the kid who would voluntarily go to bed at 6 p.m. My brother, on the other hand, he loved to stay awake until late, um, but he also loved to read. He, also, he always wanted to read a book before he went to bed. And I sleep early, but I also want the, the whole room to be dark. Um, so I wouldn't even uh, accept, you know, for, for a reflection of the light from the living room to come mm -hmm. into the room. And as kids, we shared the room together, me and him. And I remember at some point I started to get really annoyed by the fact that I would be sleeping. He walks into the room, turns on the lights and sit and read a book before he sleeps while I'm already half away in, in my sleep. And that was something for an example that I brought to the family democracy meeting um, and, and we discussed it. And I, and I remember a few years ago, um, I came across one of the notebooks um, and that was the, the meetings of the notes of the meetings that, uh, that I read, which was this issue. And I remember at the end of the, um, the notes, there was, you know, it's written, so Hajar and Muhammad both agree to the following. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the decision was that, you know, because we have to coexist peacefully in harmony, me and him in one room, the decision was that I go to bed, I sleep, the lights can be on until 8 p.m. After 8 p.m., if he wants to read the book, he will need to have a torchlight and that I should not make a fuss about the fact that there is, you know, a reflection of the light in the room. And, you know, when you think of this story, for instance, um, and, and you think of what you see politicians discuss discussing, it's not really different, you know, in, in principle, it's not really different. It's an issue that exists in a society, for instance, some group of people can be affected while others may not be affected. Um, but also the fact that this is a story about two legitimate needs and wants, right? Um, and then you just have to sit down, find the compromise and, and find the solution that can work with everyone. And that's why whenever I look at, you know, different debates surrounding different issues and, and when politicians, but also regular people would say, you know, it's, it's very complicated. We cannot talk about it or we will not be able to find a solution. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, if you manage to bring two kids together to agree on something, then as adults, we should be able to do that, certainly. It's fascinating. The story, the story is really fascinating, uh, Hajar. But let's fast forward. I mean, you were kids. We fast forward uh, 20 years. Uh, here we are. Uh, Libya is, for the first time, correct me if I'm wrong, we have a national unity government. Uh, you have quite a few women in this uh, new government. You have elections uh, coming up. Do you see this as the beginning uh, of the end of violence and turmoil in Libya? Um, how do you view the role of women in, in building the future of Libya? Is it just tokenism or is there a real willingness of, of having uh, women play uh, you know, a key role in the change that's about to come? You know, when you think of Libya, but also I, I would definitely believe that it applies to many other countries, um, it seems that there is different Libyas and different realities. It depends on who you're asking, right? If, if you ask me, um, I would say that women are already playing a crucial role, um, uh, role um, in peace building. This is something that you know, if it, whenever I'm discussing the role that women play in peace building, but also in, in all different aspects of life in Libya, I always depart from the point of view that 
they are playing an important role. This is not something that we're going to discuss whether they are or not. The problem, however, is that whether the role they're playing is reflected and represented on the highest level of decision-making processes. So, you know, talking about politics, mm -hmm. uh, are they the ones sitting with the rest of the groups in the society making decisions or not? Are um, we moving from the grassroots to the top, basically? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Is, is there a fair representation and participation at all levels? Because at least at the level of, you know, the communities and, and the local level, one can say, women are there, um, but are there there? Are there they, um, are there there? <laughs> are they there? <laughs> um, on, you know, within the, the official platforms, the formal platforms, the processes. The negotiations, the peace talks, the... Absolutely, absolutely. If we ask that question, um, it's, it's very sad to say, no, they're not. And they are not, not because they don't want to be there um, or they don't view themselves as um, powerful actors or contributors to the peace building processes at that level. It's more a question of why aren't they there and why aren't they invited to be there? Exactly. Why, why they not? Why, do, why is there this intimidation suddenly when they rise up the ladder and then there's bam, you know, you stop that rise. I mean, on the grassroots, it's okay. You can do whatever you want on the grassroots, but... Once they start, once women start rising that, that climbing that ladder, somehow there's this door that's shut. And why, why does this happen? Yes, absolutely. One of the things I, I would say is romanticizing the role of women, right? Um, it's, it seems that decision makers, or if we're talking about negotiations, for instance, right? It seems that the facilitators and the mediators of peace negotiations, for instance, mm -hmm. um, they view women on the local level as, okay, this is their very natural place to be, you know, um, to bring people together on the local level to, you know, because they, their fundamental role within the family, um, what they teach kids at school, um, but they are not seen as, you know, um, capable human beings who can handle both soft issues, but also hardcore issues, even when it comes to, to peace and security. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems that this romanticizing idea of who should sit on this peace table is one of the reasons of why it's very easy to exclude women, because you think, you know, it's a peace negotiation. We had this, this is going to be tough. This is going to be a difficult conversation. People will have to compromise. And you know who's most capable of doing this? Senior men. So we bring the senior men into, into the table and we leave everyone else out. Um, but I think this is not the only reason why women are not there because it's not women who are not accessing the negotiations or being part of negotiations. It's also the young people. Um, and, you know, there is the notion that peace tables or peace negotiations bring armed groups together, you know, because the conflict parties, basically. The conflict parties, yes. If you wage the war, the idea is that most probably you will be able to stop it, um, which is something, a thought that I'm completely against, and it's proven on the ground, right? Um, it's true, maybe one leader can start a war, but that leader can definitely not stop it because any war has a domino effect and no one person can really, you know, stop the domino effect or, or erase that to start with. Um, but what's really interesting to think of is that although they would say, okay, we need to bring the conflicting parties together because they're fighting each other, they need to stop fighting. But then when you look at these peace tables or negotiations, you don't actually see the fighting parties. You don't see, for example, the young men fighting on the ground. You see the leadership. And, and for me, I would say, okay, if you're going to convince me that the peace negotiations should only bring the fighting parties together, then frankly speaking, I would want to see these young men who are fighting on the front lines come together and sit on one table because I would want to listen to them why they are fighting each other 
And or do they know why they're fighting each other? Exactly, exactly. Absolutely, 100% agree. And not only bring the leadership who are not even on the front lines. So if we're going to discuss peace, then you really need to also, and, and once again, if you insist that these negotiations are only exclusive to the fighting parties, then let's let's bring the young people on the ground and, and let's listen to them, as you said, do they even know why they're fighting each other? And do they know that perhaps there is an, and most probably and certainly, there's an alternative path to resolve this dispute that doesn't need to be so violent, that there is a peaceful way to do in it. And the question, you know, if you think about it this way, then maybe we can also understand that, is the message really coming across? Are those on the ground, whether on the local level, let's say activists, but also those on the front lines fighting each other, did they really get the message that, you know, there's a possibility for you to resolve this dispute peacefully or are they listening to their leadership who who are not even in the gr- on the ground with them? So Hajar, based on what you're telling me, I understand that you are a firm believer that you can't have, you know, a one-sided conversation to solve a conflict, right? Even if there are different conflicting parties on the table, if they are all men, uh, that doesn't mean that the discussion is inclusive in any way. Um, Do you believe that uh, the women, the youth, the marginalized groups um, should be present and why their presence is not added value, it's the value in itself of the talks? You know, that's the $1 million question that it's so easy to answer. And it has been answered by so many people, um, by women, by young people on the ground, um, but it doesn't seem to be really well understood on the high level um, when it's it comes. It's not sticking, it's not sticking. <laughs> absolutely not, absolutely not. And this is another, I would say, romanticizing symptom. It's also romanticizing what wars are really all about and what is peace, how to bring peace, right? Because. If you think about it, the idea that one actor can bring conflicted parties together to negotiate and voila, now we have a peace agreement or we established peace just because these parties agreed to come together, shake hands, is is more or less romanticizing peace, right? Because peace is not really about only a certain group of people agreeing together. The reason we witness uh, wars or the reason um, people are willing to fight each other means that most probably there is very deep rooted causes Mm -hmm. that that led to to the outcome of a war or an armed conflict. Um, But to give you an example of why we need to have women and young people, and I would say all different groups of the society sitting on that peace table, I was once part of a a meeting that was discussing the a peace process in Libya, um, and it was a preparatory meeting, and we were discussing what are the things, the files I would call them, that needs to be on the agenda. Um, so you know there was different people on in, in the room, um, including of course senior men um, who have official titles. Um, and everyone was suggesting f- different files. Um, and I remember I suggested three files that should be a key priority in the peace uh, uh, process and peace negotiations that, you know, uh, displaced civilians, that the peace process should address the fact that there is people who were displaced because of the war and there needs to be negotiations on their returns and etc. Uh, The second file was the victims of war, Mm -hmm. uh, so that we need to have a reconciliation process that address the the grievances, etc. And, you know, these two have more or less a soft civilian element to them. They, they, it's very difficult for people to say no, because you're saying no to helping those who are affected by the armed conflict. And the third one was about dismantling of armed groups. Um, And that was the file that was, it it seemed to be a very controversial file. And I remember one of the senior official men um, in front of everyone, he turned to me and he said, 
do you really think that we would be able to discuss the dismantling of armed groups in a peace process? And I where was else, just, where else would you discuss it? <laughs> exactly, exactly. That was certainly my thinking. I was like, so this is a peace process that is going to discuss armed conflicts and wars that is fought by armed groups. And apparently this is not the right place to discuss dismantling of armed groups. Then, you know, what is this peace process is really about? And that's why it's very important to have women, young people, but also, and, and this is like the criteria of one of the groups that needs to be present on the table is those who work for a human rights based approach to peace building. Those who would, you know, come to the table and not already burdened by the fact that you need to have political compromises and so on and so on in a very early stage of the process, right? And those are the people who is going to say, okay, let's find the temporary solutions that's important because we need to stop mm -hmm. war. But you know, even if we're talking of a temporary solution, we should also start already addressing the elephants in the room. Absolutely, which, I mean, so, so many times, so many times I'm appalled by the stories I hear when um, a woman or a young person in a room introduces a topic that sounds I mean, very obvious uh, or, you know, evident that it should be discussed. And, and I'm surprised that it was never put on the agenda or it was never thought about. And I, I start questioning, you know, uh, how these people have been leading for so long. And, and maybe it justifies where we, why we are where we are today, at least in the Arab world. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's obvious, like the example you gave. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's that's why, as you said in the very beginning of our conversation, um, for me, I've only been for now, what, 10 years in the activism for peace and development community. And I'm already thinking, you know, yes, I, I literally appreciate and respect all the work that is being done by, by everyone, regardless of how small or big the effort is. But I'm also very pragmatic in the sense of saying, you know, I'm, I don't want to keep repeating something that does not yield results because this field, you know, if you're working for peace, if you're working for development, then you're also, it's, it's like you are a doctor, you know, you're touching people's lives. Either you'd be very strong and self-reflective, self-critical, and, and you know, have this conversation with you and yourself and say, am I able to do this job or not? Because it's a very demanding job. It's difficult. If you cannot do this job, I know this is going to be a very unpopular opinion. If you cannot do this job, then please leave it and let the space for someone else who is willing to be self-critical, who is willing to look at what they do. And, you know, I'm speaking as someone who's co-leading an organization. So I'm also self-critical of, of what I do, the work of my organization, and thinking it, it's not only about taking initiative. It's not only about doing something good. This is the time, you know, after you do this work for so many years, let alone there is other who has been doing this work for more many years than myself and I just think you know if it's not working let's say it's not working it's no one's fault we just need to start doing things differently but we're we're not going to start doing things differently unless we actually recognize that some things are not working and one of them is the way we do peace building because you look at Libya we already had the peace process before we already had this optimism face of okay this time it's going to work out but you know if if you can see the patterns of for an example having uh, someone a peace negotiator saying no 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 we should not talk about dismantling of armed groups okay what what are we really doing so how can we do peace building differently Oh, yo, 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 this <laughs> will be... <laughs> we need another episode for this one. But maybe like another episode. Maybe like a, a few key ideas. You know, one idea 
One that, that is very simple. That first of all, a recognition that peace means so many different things to so many different people. So let's not romanticize it, you know. If peace means something to you, it means something different to me, that's absolutely fine. When we're talking about peace building, specifically when we're talking about negotiations, you know, the formal peace processes where people are brought together, forced to agree on one thing, let's start doing things differently, just in the sense of, if we're bringing people who disagree together, let's try to bring everyone into the room because then maybe the majority of the population and the majority of the society understand that there is common ground, right? Because if the majority of the society is living peacefully, you see Libya, for an example, they say there's a civil war. If you close your eyes and you think of a civil war, you think a neighbor is slaughtering the other neighbor, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's armed group fighting each other for very right. well-known political reasons. So let's try to bring the, the peaceful majority into the room who's going to force the violent minority to come to the common ground of the peaceful majority. Because you know what, if people already reach the conclusion that they are willing to fight each other because there's something different between them, then they're most likely they will be willing to do that repeatedly, right? Mm -hmm. So the only way to actually force them to stop doing that is to bring these violent minor minority to the common ground of the peaceful majority. That's the one thing from me. <laughs> Hajar, are you in this for the long run? Oh, yo, yo, that's another uh, episode. Uh, <laughs> from, from seeing what I'm doing, from seeing where I am right now, it's, it's always going to be in, in the long term, in the long run, because I just realized, I just realized that I really cannot stand looking at something that is not right and for me to know that there is a way to make it right and not do it, you know. Um, if you ask my mom, she will tell you when I was a kid, I, uh, um, if I saw something messy, I have to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, think, I, I think this is how I also view uh, many of the issues that we're having, including um, peace and security. Um, I strongly believe it can be fixed. Um, I'm not saying I can uh, be the one who will fix it, but you know we all have to do our part. Um, and at, at one day or another, it's we're gonna get to where we want to get to. Azure, thank you so much for the insight, for the frank discussion, and thank you for being part of uh, of our um, the Diploma and Podcast family. I wish Absolutely. you all the best. <laughs> Absolutely, anytime, really. Thank you for having me, such a great initiative. Um, one of the important things is also for us uh, young women and women from the region to have the opportunity to write our own narratives, right? To tell our own stories um, and to speak open and freely without being censored in any way or another, but also without having someone else um, telling our stories on our behalf. Absolutely. This is why we have this podcast. It's for you to tell your story. Amazing. Good luck. Good Thank luck you. with the rest of the episodes. Thank you, Habibti. Thank you.